As this morning, I want to begin uh, by recognizing and thanking ASFPM for continuing to offer us this opportunity to, to engage with you. Uh, and then also, I know we spend a lot of time uh, talking uh, about and with our uh, local and state uh, partners, but certainly from FEMA's perspective and also for our the state and local uh, government, we couldn't do what we do without the support of the, of the private sector. So to start, I'd like everyone who is uh, a part of the private sector in support of FEMA and, and state and local government to please stand. So thank you very much for what you do. I also want to take this opportunity, uh, when I got here uh, yesterday, I know there was uh, some recognition for Diane Brown and her contribution to ASFPM. She certainly has been invaluable to, to FEMA and um, uh, what we do in working with ASFPM, not only the conference, but uh, throughout the year and so I also want to commend uh, Diane on her outstanding career and congratulate her as she moves into uh, some type of a, of a next adventure. Thank you Diane. As I stated this morning this conference is important to us and you see that reflected in uh, the number of my colleagues here uh, this week, 68 of us in all, a uh, pretty significant number, uh, and we recognize how important uh, you are, uh, and that's why we have this type of uh, participation with this uh, conference, and as I said, speaking in 46 sessions and the five booths in the exhibit hall. So we value our time together uh, during the conference sessions uh, in the exhibit hall, in the hallways, uh, in the hotels, and other, other establishments, and certainly, most importantly, tonight here at the annual uh, FEMA Forum. Over the last several years, uh, we've used this to leverage our important partnership and the critical role you all play in our collective mission to gather input and, in many ways, co-create our future. We've used your feedback to chart a path towards uh, new ways to depict and make individualized risk and insurance options accessible to all individuals and communities. We begin to uh, build meaningful changes in the way we manage sound floodplain management practices in the post-disaster environment, adjust the competitive priorities for pre-disaster mitigation grants, undertake substantial improvements to the risk map program to enhance the local journey, to update flood risk information, and much, much more. So what's new this year? Well, first, there's me. Uh, second, there's the new uh, FEMA strategic plan, a unified vision for how the whole community across all layers of government and down to the individual, share the responsibility and the accountability for building a more prepared and resilient nation. Disaster resiliency is the backbone of emergency management and the foundation for FEMA's mission of helping people before, during, and after dis uh, disaster. So back to, back to me. For those of you who don't know me, I'm, I'm David Marstead. Uh, the Deputy Associate Administrator for the Federal Insurance and Mitigation Administration. I'd like to share a little bit about my background because it shapes how I approach my work. I've spent uh, 35 years around the insurance industry. I worked as the Lieutenant Governor uh, for the state of Nebraska and as a state senator in the unicameral. Also served as mayor of Beatrice, Nebraska, a position that I often reflect on now uh, that I support communities at the federal level in both pre-disaster mitigation and in disaster uh, recovery. And I've spent nearly a decade working in, in FEMA as the regional administrator in Region 8 and uh, then as the assistant uh, administrator for mitigation and federal insurance from 2004 to 2008. In all of my time, both with FEMA and in the private sector, 
and state and local government, never before have I seen such an emphasis and recognition of the value of insurance and mitigation as we, as we enjoy today. There is, an, an, there is an urgent and compelling case for the work that all of us here in this room do every day. And my team and I are looking forward to engaging with you tonight on where we go, where we go next. But first, uh, a bit of uh, reflection. As the video that was playing when you, when you came in and has really been discussed throughout, throughout the week, the 50th anniversary of the, of the NFIP has taught us a few things about the value of insurance and mitigation. We've seen time and time again that individuals, communities, and businesses that responsibly manage risk through insurance recover faster and more fully after a disaster. While FEMA disaster assistance supports individuals in the immediate aftermath of a presidentially declared disaster, this federal support is, is only temporary. It's a, an emergency safety net for immediate needs. It does not provide for complete financial recovery. So we need to break the myth that the federal government will bail you out after these disasters. For example, the average flood insurance payout in the uh, Harris County uh, last year was, uh, the flood insurance payout was nearly 20 times higher than the average uh, individual assistance pay payment. Now that's real money in the hands of survivors, allowing them to stay in their community, repair their homes, get back to work, and move further and faster down the road to recovery. We've also seen that losses are dramatically reduced or avoided through sound floodplain management and investing in mitigation. And we know that mitigation pays off. Uh, it's been talked during this conference. Uh, the National Institute of Building Sciences recently released an updated and, uh, an expansion to their landmark 2005 study that now indicates a six to one average return on investment from mitigation. I mean, mitigation is even more valuable than we, than we thought before or that we've been saying. Mitigation and insurance impact more than just the bottom line. In my mind, they can alleviate the human suffering that we see time and time again after and once the storm has cleared. But right now, there simply isn't enough of either. Our mission, our efforts, our rally cry should be less disaster suffering and more insured survivors. To this end, our work is just beginning. The U.S. currently has the largest insurance gap among countries globally. Swiss Re reports that the annual expected uninsured losses from earthquake, flood, and wind the damage from those in the U.S. total more than $30 billion, the uninsured losses based on their, on their models. This means that of the total estimated catastrophic losses in the U.S. of $55 billion annually, more than half aren't insured. They have to close the insurance gap. The impacts are real. CoreLogic estimates that more than three out of four survivors of wind and flood damage from Hurricane Harvey and Irma suffered property losses that were not covered by insurance. And it means that at least $48 billion was not available, AWOL, from the disaster recovery effort. We face this ins insurance gap at the same time that the frequency, severity, and costs of disasters continues to rise. Despite our historic investment in mitigation, we will continue to struggle to meaning, meaningfully buy down the nation's increasing risk if we rely primarily on FEMA grant dollars in the post-disaster environment. Administrator Brock Long is committed to bringing mitigation investment forward, supporting pre-disaster mitigation to a greater extent than ever before. As professionals in the emergency management field, we have one of the most important missions in government, 
coordinating resources to help communities and individuals before, during, and after disasters. And throughout the conference this week, you've heard us speak about the core tenets of the 2018 to 2022 FEMA strategic plan. To reiterate, this is more than FEMA's plan. This strategic plan creates a shared vision to guide FEMA and the nation in delivering that mission. The plan sets out three overarching goals, supporting objectives that we will pursue. The goals are, again, building a culture of preparedness, readying the nation for catastrophic disasters, and reducing the complexity of FEMA. Tonight, we will touch on uh, upon all three of these goals, but really dive into the first, building a culture of preparedness, to share some of what FEMA and the NFIP are doing and explore what you might do to advance it. So start thinking about what you might do to advance it. So starting from the bottom up, we will reduce the complexity of FEMA. As FEMA has responded to different challenges over the years, we acknowledge our programs have become complicated, redundant, and difficult to navigate. Similar to the customer-centric transformation that we've been doing in the NFIP and mitigation for the last few years, all of FEMA is going to be working to streamline the disaster survivor and grantee experience. Next, FEMA is working to ready the nation for catastrophic events. States and communities must increase their capacity to respond to smaller, to smaller scale disasters so that FEMA and our federal partners can focus on readiness of the catastrophic events. Last year's disaster season demonstrated that FEMA must work closer with our government partners to build capabilities to deliver quicker, more tailored assistance directly where and when it is needed. And to build resiliency and help us achieve these two goals, we will build a culture of preparedness. Every segment of our society, from individual to government, industry to philanthropy, must be encouraged and empowered with the information needed to prepare for the inevitable impact of disasters. Simply put, people need to know what their risks are, what they should do to prepare and protect themselves. For FIMA and the NFIP, successfully building a culture of preparedness means we close the insurance gap. About 80% of the 120,000 homes in Harris County, Texas, damaged by flooding in Hurricane Harvey last year were uninsured. Those homeowners, renters, uh, had to rely on the FEMA disaster assistance, SBA loans, charitable contributions, or their own financial, uh, personal finances to recover. For many, that's leading to uh, longer recovery, more debt, and generally, uh, much more unneeded disaster suffering. But this was not unexpected, and we should not have been surprised. We witnessed similar uninsured losses after almost every flood catastrophe, and we must do better. We must all work together to ensure communities understand that flooding can happen anywhere, not just in the high-risk areas delineated on flood maps, and that flood insurance is their first line of defense, not FEMA. And we must incentivize mitigation that reduce risks ahead of when a disaster hits. For our nation to protect life and property and pull back the increasing costs of disasters, we must bring resilient mitigation investments forward. Communities must build to reduce risk to people, property, and taxpayer dollars ahead of an incident to reduce losses and suffering. Buying down the risk prior to a disaster pays off, either by lowering the cost of the disaster or eliminating the need of a presidentially declared disaster altogether because of the lessened impact. And when communities are impacted by a disaster, they must be accountable for rebuilding better, tougher, and stronger. Strengthening the nation's ability to withstand disasters with limited loss reduces our risk. Bringing, building a culture of preparedness 
including increasing mitigation investments and closing the insurance gap, is the most effective way to improve resiliency. For FEMA's uh, Federal Insurance and Mitigation Administration and our partners in and outside of government, this is a tremendous opportunity. It is also a challenge for us, and we all need to step up. Last year, at this event, we spoke with you about our two moonshots to double the number of properties covered by flood insurance and quadruple the nation's investment in mitigation. These moonshots are how FIMA and our partners will help to deliver on our new strategic plan. Our moonshots are key to building a culture of preparedness and making us more resilient. And we need every single one of you in this room and your peers that aren't in this room to help us get there. FEMA plays the essential role, but meaningful improvements, in my opinion, will only occur when we work in concert across state, local, tribal, and territorial governments, federal departments and agencies, non-governmental organizations, and the private sector. In fact, I'm, I am convinced, based on my background and experience, that we will not be successful unless all of you embrace these goals. So what, does that, so what does that look like? First, we start by acknowledging the fact that encouraging individuals in our states and communities to carry flood insurance is a priority job duty. Each of us needs to walk the walk and talk the talk, not just talk the talk. Start with yourself. Have you personally checked your own insurance policies lately? Have you had a discussion with your agent or company representative? Do you have adequate coverage for your home and the life you've built? Do you have a flood insurance policy? Next, recognize your position of influence and use it. We all must incorporate flood insurance in our preparedness and recovery messaging. In your speeches, state and community level meetings, or through social media, or talking neighbor to neighbor, Please discuss the value and the importance of insurance and closing the insurance gap. And it helps to set goals. Get to know the flood insurance penetration in your state or in your community and work to get it higher. And I especially challenge the CRS community to incorporate policy growth in your criteria. Challenge yourselves, your staff, and your partners to increase policies and coverage in and out of the high risk flood areas because your community is faced, when your community is faced with a disaster, it will make all the difference in the recovery. Second, make the case for smart mitigation investment. Making informed investments in mitigation isn't just good government, it's good business. And above all, it's the right thing to do. Every home that is mitigated means a family is protected from the next disaster. But folks, I'd suggest that you need to be working to identify large-scale, community-level mitigation projects that will truly change the risk profile in your community, especially if the proposed legislation to dedicate a fixed percentage of disaster cost to pre-disaster mitigation is adopted. And we, need, we will need more partners to join in these game-changing mitigation efforts. We'll need them to contribute their own resources, direct funding, incentives, intellectual capital, and drive additional investments through their own networks. Share the updated mitigation save study widely with those in business of mitigation and, more importantly, those who are not. Use the six to one return on investment to broaden the mitigation conversation with the private sector and new partners. Quadrupling the investments in mitigation isn't only about increasing FEMA grant dollars, although we need to uh, be ready should that happen. It's about catalyzing and incentivizing mitigation investments from new partners and in new ways. As we talk about the collective ownership of national resilience, my team is here to uh, share in a bit more detail 
what we are doing to close the gap, insurance gap, and increase investments in mitigation. So joining me uh, this evening are Mike Grimm, the Assistant Administrator for Mitigation, Nick Shufro, the Assistant Administrator for Risk Management, and Paul Wong, Assistant Administrator for Federal Insurance. We'll give these gentlemen a few minutes to share, but we are aiming to carve about 30 minutes at the end of this session for table discussions on how we can advance these goals together. I've been a local official, as I mentioned, and while the advice and tools from, from FEMA might be a helpful starting point, I know that you are best positioned to find the approaches that work in your community to achieve these goals. Now, from there, we ask that you share your best practices, lessons, and ideas with us and each other. So to begin uh, this conversation, you'll notice that uh, you've got some table topic cards at your table. At about six of us, the four, on, the four of us on the stage, uh, plus a couple of our other senior executives, uh, Angie Gladwell and Eric Letvin. Uh, would you please stand? Eric's there, bright lights, where's Angie? There you are, great. So they'll join us and we'll step off the stage and join a few tables uh, for discussion. And we'd like every table in this room, regardless of one of the six of us are at the table, to select a topic from the cards on your table and engage with each other with ideas and successes from your home communities and states. Also, please capture the key challenges or opportunities that we're collectively facing to close the insurance gap and increase the mitigation investment. And then for the last 10 or so minutes of tonight's session, uh, we'll gather back up on stage and share uh, some of our key takeaways uh, and, and highlights. So with that, uh, Mike, why don't, you, why don't you get us started? All right, good evening, everybody. So, uh, wow, Phoenix in June, huh? I checked my uh, weather channel a minute ago and it's, it's 107 degrees out right now, so you're better off in this room, you know, but um, I think the Arizona State motto might be, uh, uh, but it's a dry heat, like a convection oven. Um, you know, I feel like a, one of those li little roasted chickens every time I walk out side for lunch or something and um, yeah I know what you're all thinking little roasted chicken no big roasted chicken right <laughs> all right so anyway um, so this morning um, Laura Lightbody from Pew said some made some uh, very interesting comments about how our national policy and regulatory environment has led us here to some uh, really I think she said perverse incentives that lead to risky behaviors, such as uh, living and occupying floodplains uh, and encouraging development. All the while, we're underinvesting in mitigation. So tonight, we're here to further explore some of those concepts and those comments. Um, you know, and with the legislation that's out there and all the things going on, now is perhaps the time that we have and the opportunity to start driving some more positive policies in a different direction. And perhaps that's, that may be through our own actions, as well as when we go back to our communities and drive some actions there. So I wanna do a little one of those raise your hand things, um, and I want you guys to keep your hands up. So you know we've been talking about um, where it can rain, it can flood, right? So. So how many, raise your hand, if, how many folks agree that where it can rain, it can flood? I'm assuming it's the whole room, right? Okay, all right. So, and keep your hands up until you don't keep your hand up when I ask a question. How many folks live in a place that it can rain? Okay, so my, my wife and I went to Sedona this weekend, uh, this like groovy little mystical vortexy place. So, 
All of you who believe in telekinesis, please raise my hand now. All right. How many of you have flood insurance? Aren't we a bunch of hypocrites? Seriously. Me too. I put my hand down. Yesterday, while I was sitting out there in the plenary, I texted my, or emailed my, uh, my agent to give me some quotes on flood insurance. So, if you're going to go back to your community and start preaching the gospel, do it to yourself first, okay? I'm doing it. I, don't know what, I, I wasn't watching you guys. I know Paul has a policy. So, anyway. Um, so, with that. So, uh, 2017 and 18, some pretty major years um, for lessons learned and things that we went through. You know, we've been talking about the 50th anniversary of the NFIP, and we also have the 30th anniversary of HMGP. What I want to do is reflect back a little bit um, on the 30 years uh, of NFIP and the 50 of, uh, uh, 30 years of HMGP and, and uh, uh, 30 of uh, 50 of NFIP and talk about what we've accomplished, but also look forward and and where we're going. So, our first acquisition project um, was in Utah, and our first safe room was in Iowa, and our first tribal project in California. When we started the grant programs, the annual budget was about two hundred thousand dollars, and that was mostly for outreach to communities. So, two hundred thousand um, dollars. Since then, you all know it's really evolved and changed in many ways. Uh, we now, of course, have the Flood Mitigation Assistance Program and the Pre-Disaster Mitigation Program. And now we've provided $15 billion to states, communities, and tribes and territories across the country to reduce risk. Sounds like a lot of money. Um, I think we all agree, uh, and with some of the stuff going on on the Hill right now, that that's a drop in the bucket. Uh, that really is a drop in the bucket. Um, now we have acquired 55,000 properties as open space. That's, that's big. Um, I think we stirred you guys up a little bit this past few months with a federal register notice, maybe, about this acquisition thing, and there's a whole session about it, and uh, I've been trying to recover uh, on that, but hopefully we'll, uh, we'll get through that. But that's, you know, that's another tool in the toolbox that we're exploring, but 55,000 properties, uh, 37,000 safe rooms, 10,000 properties elevated, I mean, the list goes on, right? We have done a lot of great mitigation work. And then you look at the NFIP, 23,000 communities, um, nearly 23,000, where we've built a presence. And I think David said this, right, that most of our programs, all the FEMA programs really, um, only arrive after a disaster strikes. But the NFIP affects every one of those uh, nearly 23,000 communities every day by lowering the built environment's exposure to flood. Um, it's amazing. It's, we say it's $1.9 billion in losses avoided per year. Um, that's a big accomplishment. And then, of course, um, David threw the challenge out to our uh, nearly 1,500 CRS communities, which, um, yeah, every, they, they, uh, those communities have adopted a more assertive approach to floodplain management, but we have got to keep pushing. We've got to keep doing more on that. That's where 70% of our flood policies are, policies are sold. So I think back of the, the last year or two and all the disasters and the lessons we've learned. I'm not sure we've learned them because I think when I tell you the three things that I think we've all been talking about, they're, they're the same lessons we learn every big disaster or, or think about for a little while, right? People and communities need to understand the risk better than they do now. Uh, we've been talking about that for a long time. Risk communication, there's a lot of sessions going on this week, which are terrific. I just came, came out on one before this. Uh, as a nation, we have to mitigate our risk and pre-disaster, and more people need to have flood insurance, and not just flood insurance, right? I'm preaching to the choir. It's got to happen before the disaster strikes. <clears throat> so the post-disaster mitigation spending, though, is so much higher I mean, look at, the, look at the scale. It's just crushing the scale here, uh, right? Since 2003, $10.3 billion in post-disaster funding versus $1.8 in pre-disaster funding. And this leads to the strategic plan and the moonshots. I mean, it's clear for mitigation what we need to do. We have to find ways to buy down that risk, making larger investment before the disaster occurs. 
And we've got to encourage our private sector partners, and I'm not talking about the folks in the room who are already engaged in this, but what about those private sector folks who aren't engaged in risk uh, analysis and mitigation, and how do we talk to them, and how do we encourage that participation as well? And then, of course, simplifying our programs. And um, I'll be sitting at a table with some folks, I'm sure, who will, um, the question at my table is, is all about simplifying programs. Um, so what are we doing? We're, we're doubling down in the NFIP on our post-disaster work. Uh, many of you saw the post-disaster compliance work workshops. There's a number of those going on. We know that rebuilding is uh, uh, to a compliance structure or higher is uh, how to make flood insurance affordable, for example. And we're also assisting communities in that post-disaster environment. David mentioned the $5 billion in HMGP that's available. And to meet that moonshot, it's not about quadrupling the, uh, the federal investment. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I joked with David that I'm done with that, right? With uh, $5 billion in the big PDM piece. Um, with the $249 million available this year for PDM. But folks, we have an opportunity in front of us with the Hill Bill that is going through, and I know there's some folks in the audience, there's pieces of that bill that not everybody likes, but that is gonna change the face of pre-disaster mitigation if it should pass. That would make billions of dollars potentially available. It's a big year this year for PDM with 249 million. That's the biggest we've ever had, and that's the most we could get. But quite frankly, you know, think about what's in that bill, and I urge you, this is, this is, this may be the time, the only time that we get that opportunity to move pre-disaster mitigation forward. We're usually sitting here talking about the Flood Act. This is Stafford Act change. This changes the face of mitigation. So with that, I'm going to close. I know we're, we're, we're trying to leave some time. Um, look forward to talking with you all at the tables and how to, how to uh, accomplish our moonshots and simplify our programs. Uh, with that, I am going to turn it over to my friend Nick Shufro, who runs the uh, Risk Management Division. Delighted to be here, and uh, I owe everybody in the room an apology. I, uh, I missed the first two days, but it was a really good reason. Um, my daughter graduated from high school yesterday, so I was at this time uh, celebrating last night, so glad to be here and uh, glad to spend time catching up with folks uh, over the next couple of days. So I'm Nick Shufro. I, um, I am with uh, the Risk Management Directorate, and the Risk Management Directorate has a vital role in working with the NFIP and helping people to understand their risk and available options to reduce their risk. Um, we are, we have a number of different programs, and let's see if I can move to the next slide, please. Um, you can see in the upper left corner a number of our different programs, um, which we work with, uh, as, as uh, Mike mentioned, uh, we work with 22,000 communities um, on the flood hazard mapping program and to identify flood risk and to promote risk-informed decision-making. In addition, uh, we have a number of programs, including the dam safety program, the levee safety program. Uh, we also have our, we house the actuaries who uh, contribute and who measure and manage risk through the setting of insurance rates. Um, and we, uh, we do a lot to promote an understanding of individual risks, enabling people to make decisions that uh, really can change the thrust of what they do. As David mentioned earlier, uh, we have a new strategic plan and we have two goals, uh, building a culture of preparedness and reducing the complexity of FEMA are two that are really critical to uh, the Risk Management Directorate. And I wanted to share some of the activities that we've got um, that contribute primarily to those two uh, goals, although we do uh, support all three goals. Um, think about the risk mapping program and where we started out a couple of years ago, where uh, maps were essentially paper maps. And a number of years ago, we started on a journey to move from paper maps through the map modernization program to try and digitize maps. Uh, fast forward a couple years later on, 
and uh, having digitized maps was great, but we also wanted to work to uh, make sure that we had really good stakeholder engagement. And so the risk map program, uh, one of the tenets of the risk management program, uh, risk map program was to really engage with communities and individuals so they could better understand their risks. Right now, we are working on three different priorities, and I wanted to share a little bit about these priorities. Uh, they're not prioritized based on their priority. They're all equally important, but they are all helpful in how, helping us figure out how to price and communicate and manage risk. So the first program is the uh, Risk Rating Redesign or Risk Rating and Product Redesign Program. And it's really, really essential in figuring out how we get to fair rates and how we communicate the risk associated with where you live. So the risk rating and product redesign uh, program will leverage data and uh, technology to try and make sure that people have an understanding of what their risk is uh, over time. And we'll provide a credible view of risk. It'll break it down based on geography, based on where the property sits, uh, a number of different other parameters. And uh, it will provide some, uh, some, some geographic differentiation, some uh, locational dif differentiation, and we're assuming that uh, this will be really helpful for people for understanding what their risk is. Um, as part of our continuous improvement process, we're going to start off uh, in, by announcing the first set of new rates on April 1st, 2019. Uh, we're then going to run some pilots and work with a geography uh, uh, that we will be announcing. And we expect to deliver our first set of rates in a year later on April 1st, 2020. Just imagine how this conversation is going to change over time when you really have an understanding of what your risk is and how it's specific to the properties that you're managing. And just think about the types of changes we're going to have to make within our own playbooks to adjust for this really revolutionary program. Uh, it's no longer gonna be a discussion of whether or not a property is in or without, outside of a 1% line. And it's really, going to be, uh, it's really gonna be focused on what are the things, the physical characteristics of the property, and what are some of the mitigation activities that you can do to help reduce your risk. So we're all gonna have to update our playbooks, and we're very excited about the risk rating and product redesign program and we look forward to engaging with you and learning more from you and working with you over time to figure this out. The second area uh, that we wanted to talk about is uh, related to, and David mentioned this before, this is really related to uh, the catalyzing mitigation investments or the mitigation investment moonshot. Um, the last graphic that Mike Grimm just shared around moving mitigation forward is one that I just want to let you know I've stolen that slide and used it a number of times since you presented it. Um, what we're really trying to do is uh, better organize around mitigation efforts. And as Mike just shared, we're going to be trying to move mitigation forward. So if you, if you will, back a couple of years ago to uh, July of 2015, the Government Accountability Office came out with a report based on interviews of states and communities um, that were uh, impacted by Hurricane Sandy. And the question, one of the big findings was, you know, the federal government does a lot and does a lot around helping us out after an event, but it's really complicated. And not only do we have to deal with FEMA, but we dealt with 16 other agencies. And there's an opportunity to do a little better job in terms of actually uh, coordinating, being a little more efficient, and seeing if there are ways to simplify life. So uh, the GAO report came out, and a group called the MITFLAG, which is the uh, Mitigation Framework Leadership Group, was established. It actually had been established beforehand, but MITFLAG is 22 federal agencies, and the two 20, 22 federal agencies started working on a draft mitigation investment strategy. Originally entitled a Federal Mitigation Investment Strategy, it was later renamed to a National Mitigation Investment Strategy. As both David and, and Mike mentioned, this is not a FEMA strategy, this is not a FEMA imperative, this is a national strategy that uh, goes beyond just the federal government. So that was uh, started about two years ago, 
And in January of this year, the draft National Mitigation Investment Strategy was released for public comment. Many of you in the room provided comments. Uh, the comment period was from January through March. We had 750 different comments that came in. And we're still processing those comments, and we're hoping to release a, an updated mitigation investment strategy later this year. Some of the concepts that came across from the feedback when we synthesized it was that mitigation is uh, complex and poorly understood. That there, are, there were a number of ideas around different requirements that should be enacted, different incentives to try and promote this. We also needed to come up with a better connection between mitigation and economic resiliency, community resiliency, public, and safe, public safety, et cetera. We also had to make sure that uh, we weren't favoring any particular communities and that there was equal access to mitigation resources. And then we also needed to spend some time looking at infrastructure, including green and gray infrastructure. So this goal, the second um, uh, activity around the draft mitigation investment strategy is still in process, but it's something that will help to uh, engage federal agencies, state, local, tribal partners, the private sector, philanthropies, a number of different organizations, and helping us to organize where we're going. The next area in the catalyzing mitigation investment strategy was the moonshot. So you saw the pictures that David showed of the mitigation investment moonshot. And in, that partic in this particular case, uh, FIMA itself uh, announced these, as David said before, two years ago. Um, and the idea was that we would actually put a quantitative goal and also a time limitation on trying to achieve the goal. So actually it was announced in February of 2017, not quite two years ago. Um, and the goal is, was originally to quadruple mitigation investment by 2023. Uh, we've now moved to uh, be a little more aggressive, so we're looking to quadruple that mitigation investment by 2022. And part of what we're doing is we're setting up a baseline because in order to figure out where we need to go, we need to figure out where we're starting from. And so we've co captured a number of different federal agencies' investments. We're also looking for state contribu contributions to mitigation. We're looking with cities, private sectors, and we're going to be releasing our baseline, we hope, in July of this year. So this is uh, the second activity. It's a lot of work, and we'd love to engage with you to understand how you uh, figure out what types of mitigation investments you're making and where there's opportunities to increase those mitigation investments. The final area around uh, mitigation, uh, catalyzing mitigation activities is this concept of partnering. And um, we started off by, uh, David started off by saying, we're really interested in finding out who are the private sector participants because you do a lot with us. Similarly, mitigation floodplain managers, you're very engaged with us in this. And so it is going to be a partnership and we are looking to engage with you and figure out what are some of the new ideas. So my table will be looking at this question in particular, what are some of the new ideas around how we can catalyze mitigation investments with the private sector and other partners as we're looking forward for uh, trying to figure out how to actually achieve this moonshot. The third and final area uh, that I'll be, I wanted to share some insights is around a program called Evolving Risk Map. It's great that we want to uh, have fair and equitable pricing. It's great that we want to, to have people understand what their, their risk is, but part of what we need to do is actually figure out how to get there. How do we set the rates? And as I started off by saying, uh, we move from paper maps, we move to digitized maps. We now need to use technology and data to be able to figure out where there are opportunities. So on the evolving risk map, uh, we are working and we've just finished sort of the, what do we wanna do? We're now in the design phase. And the idea is to leverage technology, leverage insights, just really go out and figure out what are the ways that we can do this effectively uh, explore new opportunities with uh, providers. So we're very much open to ideas. And we're taking valuable input from you. We're hoping to figure this out. And we're looking to uh, launch this, this new initiative over time so we can actually uh, achieve our objectives. So I do want to close by just saying that um, before you hear from Paul, who's going to talk about a number of really critical things 
not to take your thunder, but uh, you know, the importance of customer experience and being a world-class organization. We do value your input. We do value your ideas. We look forward to working with you on all of our initiatives, and we really appreciate the time that you're taking and the input that you provide to us. So with that, I'll turn it over to Paul. Hi, everyone. I'm Paul Huang. I'm the Assistant Administrator for Federal Insurance. Um, as David said, our new strategic plan starts with priority number one, and I actually think those are in order. They're not like the children where you have to love them, all three of those equally, but culture of preparedness is number one, and a big part of that is closing the insurance gap. So why is that important to, I like David's language, uh, lessen survivor suffering? Um, let me show you a video about uh, why that's important. I wanted to have a place with a garden, and that's why I bought this house. It was beautiful. This was the house that I bought just by myself. We had lots of flowers in the house. We had lots of memories, little pictures of my grandson, my young children when they were born, and uh, life was good. Flooding from Hurricane Harvey hit, my house was filled with about 20 inches of water. The water came through the walls, through the window, through everywhere, and very quickly, I just was stunned. As the water started rising, my neighbors came to help. And because of them, I was able to save some of my precious saris and few photographs. Even though this house was never flooded, I bought flood insurance just in case. Even after all this, having flood insurance meant having one thing less to worry about. I love that video and that um, we did 120,000 claims last year, and there are a lot of people like that. It's one less thing to worry about, less survivor suffering. And I love Mike's question because what's surprising to me is we're experts in this field, yet such a small portion of us actually make that choice to buy flood insurance. So it's difficult, it's not easy, but go back and evaluate that because uh, my question would, would have been how many people actually have suffered a flood? So I think more hands than actually people have that have insurance, and we saw that in, in Harvey. So we need more people protected because there will someone in this room um, is going to suffer a flood. I guarantee it in the next year or two, um, and I'm hoping that they're like Rupee there and they have the protection they need. So uh, we're far from a moonshot, but the trajectory is right. Our goal this year was actually 660 contracts in force, new net contracts in force towards our 2022 doubling moonshot. We're about 140,000 contracts in the positive this year. And we're projecting to be about 300,000 by the end of the year, which is good progress. Um, but we're gonna probably miss the mark. We need something to change the trajectory. We need to keep building on the momentum that we're building on. Uh, we need you guys to play a critical role. And I'm looking forward to the next session here where we're gonna hear from you how do we continue to change that trajectory? How do we get people to insure? Um, for us, it starts with being a world-class operation. So the picture up here is Tesla. I love Tesla. By, by the way, our external affairs always says, I am not endorsing Tesla, <laughs> but I, I do like their cars um, personally. But they're having a problem because you can be really cool and innovative. You can be really neat and innovative and advanced, but you know what they're having a problem with? Their basic operations. They said that they would produce 5,000 of these Teslas a week, and they're only at 22,000. So they're losing credibility with investors. They're losing credibility with their potential customers. We're the same way. So I have a picture up here of a Virginia Tech center. I went to Virginia Tech. Um, but I bet, how many people in here could name a starting center in the National Football League? Versus how many people can name a starting quarterback? All right, not enough people watch football. But 
The center is such an important role on that team. They touch the ball every single play. And if they bobble it, they missnap it, or they call out the wrong coverages, something bad's going to happen. So we're starting with that in federal insurance. We're starting it by doing the right things, the small things, so that we can start creating credibility around flood insurance for our program. And part of that is our technology. So we run on an old mainframe, and next year we'll be out of that. So we're investing heavily in technology. Why are you doing that? So we can actually look at fraud analytics to see where our claims are rightfully played and perhaps where there are pockets of fraud. We can use it to use um, modern apps where people expect to buy their policies through an app or to process their claims by taking a couple pictures or videos. By starting to build on our technologies, we're gonna build credibility in our program so that customers start going, wow, that's a modern program. I want to be a part of the flood insurance program. They're credible. And it will allow us to better target and service our customers. Other things are the simple things. Like we're, I just saw a preview of our new claims in, in underwriting manual this week. And I was really impressed. If you've seen our old manual, you really needed a PhD or a, uh, a law degree to really interpret this. But it's plain language with a lot of pictures. So now that a policyholder, if a policyholder wanted to pick up a claims manual or an underwriting manual and actually say, what am I getting covered for? It's much simpler. And throughout the supply chain, it's gonna be much simpler for our adjusters, for our agents. And the more people that are comfortable with the simpler plain language product, the more people will buy. So those are just a couple examples of what we're doing to, in continuing to, to continue to improve our program and be a world-class operation. And that's fundamental to being uh, to achieving our moonshot. So the next thing is customer service. Um, Nordstrom tells a lot of stories so to build a customer service culture. And I told one this week at an all hands meeting. We had, um, I want to recognize two of my staff, Crystal Montague and Susan Bernstein. We got a call from um, a survivor in Puerto Rico and said, I haven't had an agent come out and it's been six months, I mean an adjuster come out and it's been several months. I don't know what to do. So we said, ma'am, we'll look this up. We looked down our database, and she didn't have a policy with the flood insurance program. And we could have just stopped there and said, we don't have a policy with you. Let me refer you to the commissioner's office. Um, perhaps we can locate um, someone to come out and see your home. Instead, we found that the person had a, we had a relationship with their agent through some other means. We contacted the commissioner the agent, and within a week got an adjuster out there. And it wasn't even our policy. And I told that story because that's the type of customer service we want to provide. Because whether it's from the private sector or the public sector, we care about people getting good service. And when they do, they go tell their neighbor, I had a great experience with the flood insurance program. Um, and they might not know, private or public. And you know what? That person is probably going to refer their neighbor uh, to a flood policy and it probably will be the National Flood Insurance Programs. Um, so that's the type of thing we're building on. This year we're actually putting out some claim surveys, so we're collecting real feedback through that claims experience from customers. We're gonna try it with our NFIP Direct this summer and see how people respond. It puts our adjusters on, on um, notice that someone is not gonna judge them not just by whether or not they came in and out, but did they get treated fairly? Did a customer get treated fairly? By doing this surveying, we're gonna get some real feedback and isolate where we can improve our customer service. We're also putting out a customer service guide to all of our adjusters and agents to kind of practice what we preach and say, these are the things that are important. It's not just about knowing the rules, it's not just about executing the policy, but it's also about being customer-centric. And when you do that, people refer to others to the, policy, to the program and say, this is a good experience. I see value in the product. Last thing is really what David and others have said. We need your ideas. We can't do this alone. Um, I happen to be the type of person that's walking around and I can't get it in my, out of my head. So every once in a while, I'll see um, something and it'll trigger a thought. And I go, how do we leverage that into more flood insurance sales? So my wife is always like, shut off your brain. Um, but I don't have all the ideas. You guys do. And you have the local credibility. You know your communities. Um, I was on a call with the region a couple weeks ago and they said, my community is asking me, what do I do about the moonshot? We believe in it. What do I do? 
And I reversed it and said, I don't know. You know your community, you live there, you are influencers in your community, why don't you tell me? So we can give you some tips and tools, but you guys, we're looking for your ideas. The last slide is we need innovations. Uh, I took a taxi from the airport and, I, and every time I take a taxi now I think, are these guys gonna be in business anymore in a couple of years? How many people ride shared here instead? Right. There's something game changing that needs to happen. So we are, we are investing in risk rating, like Nick said, and product redesign. Those are some of the innovations we're doing that are really gonna fundamentally change the direction of the, our moonshot. But we need your ideas. What else is there that will really change that trajectory where when Mike asks the question, everyone's arms are up and when we say, who doesn't have flood insurance? Um, you see, we see a lot fewer folks that say, um, I don't. We gotta change that social norm, and you guys are a big part of it. We need some big ideas. So the next slide, beyond this, when you go home, if you still have a thought, we're collecting them on either moonshot, quadrupling mitigation or doubling our policies. So we need your ideas, and if you have them, share them, and we're either gonna celebrate you and bring you up on stage and say, look at this grand idea that changed and helped so many people. Um, you'll be a hero to me and I'm happy to do it. Um, so help us, send us these, these ideas through this. But now for today. So you've heard us talk a lot. It's your turn. For those that are in sparser tables, I would encourage you to join a larger table. A couple, we'll be down there joining some random tables. Um, what, I, what you will see in front of you is uh, kind of a placemat card. And this is the question that we, got, we want you to target on. What are those game-changing creative ideas on either in the mitigation space or the insurance space that you want to discuss and share? And if you're stuck on that topic, it's like Trivia Pursuit. There are lots of different colors here. You could pick a different category. But what we want is your inputs. And you can jot them down on the papers on your desk, and we'll collect them afterwards, and we'll summarize and collect those ideas. Or you can use the pollev.com slash FEMA and I tried it earlier, it's very easy, it's just a text box, and you can type in your ideas, and we'll collect those. Because again, we can't do this alone. This is a national goal. Both of these are national goals, and we can't do it just on the FEMA side. We need your inputs and ideas, and I'm look at really looking for that big game-changing idea, or something better in customer service, or how we can improve our operations. So with that, we will spend 20 minutes at the tables and then we'll reconvene and do a recap and then you guys are free to go to happy hour. So while Eric's coming up, uh, first of all, thank you all for uh, participating in that little, uh, that little exercise. Um, I'm, I'm a firm believer that it will, that it will certainly, uh, certainly help us. And uh, now that I have my, uh, most of my leadership, uh, your leadership, FIMA's leadership team up here, I want to uh, commend them for uh, what they're doing and the support that they provide, uh, not only FIMA, but their individual directorates and uh, their staff. So thank you very much to all of them. So what did we learn? Uh, anybody have something that they'd like to uh, share while we, uh, while we wrap up this session? Sure, I'll share, David. Wonderful. Um, the question that our table was talking about was about risk communication. What kind of risk information or depictions of flood risk are making a difference in your state or community? What are you seeing as far as new ways to communicate flood risk? And it was uh, a very lively conversation as we started talking about communicating risk. And I think many of our participants had gone to the session right before this on risk communication. And a lot of the feedback was that one, were asking the wrong question uh, and really started talking about that we always start with us and what we know and what information we have and then look to how we communicate it rather than starting with the audience and the people that we're communicating to, what they, com they care about, what's important to them and how you shape your messages around that and work your way backwards. So we talked a lot about how important it was to know your audience um, and really be able to shape even the words you use. We talked about 
using safety versus protect and uh, versus risk and how you use the right words to be able to get to the audience that you're talking to, whether you're talking to community officials or a homeowner, it really matters because they're taking that information differently. The other thing that was an important takeaway for me was about talking about community-based partnerships and how powerful they can be in terms of communicating risk and bringing together people with different interests um, and different positions, bringing them around the table. And we talked about specifically one that was on farm fish and flood issues how you bring them together and find the common ground across those issues as a way to start making progress um, on the issues that are impacting all of them uh, to include flood risk. So those were a couple of the key takeaways that I had uh, and uh, I'm real interested in others that talked about this question and, and what, you, what you heard as well. Thank you, Angie.